Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. Today's video is going to be my submission for the second Knife Makers of YouTube challenge, which in this case is going to be a Bowie knife. Now I am not a pro when it comes to hidden tang knives. This is actually the third hidden tang knife on my channel. I made some big mistakes with this knife, however, there are a lot of components of this knife that I really do like. So I'm going to go through the detail towards the end of what I like and what I don't like about how this knife turned out. My favorite part about these challenges is that they push me outside of my comfort zone, which in reality is the whole point of this channel. The point is to continue to learn how to make knives in new and interesting ways. If you don't keep learning in the knife making game or in any game for that matter, then it's not fun anymore and there's really no point to do it. So with that being said, during the course of this video, I ended up making four new tools that will help me with hidden tang knives in the future. I will be putting those mini tool builds throughout this video, so stay tuned for those. To make this buoy, we're going to be utilizing my new 30 ton hydraulic forging press to make some Damascus. This first stack of Damascus is 15 layers of 1084 and 15 and 20. Now I made a couple mistakes with this first forge weld that resulted in me having to grind away a large amount of the material. So this knife ended up being much smaller than I originally intended. But that's fine, I got better with the forge welds as I went and I didn't lose that much more material in the subsequent stacks. My major mistake on the first stack was not putting a weld down the center of the stack and that resulted in it bowing out a little bit once the heat hit it and I didn't get a good weld on probably the first or second layer of steel there. So I think I ground away probably two or three of those 15 layers. While drawing out the first stack, I noticed that I had a little bit of a hard time with controlling the hydraulic press and not over smashing the stack or over thinning out the stack. So in order to mitigate this problem, I will be making some kiss blocks in a new set of dies. The way these work is I will weld the kiss blocks to a saddle and I can make a couple different sizes with different saddles. So all I have to do is take them on and off of this set of square dies. Not only do these kiss blocks or stop blocks prevent me from over thinning my Damascus billet, it also allows me to have a nice consistent thickness on my final billet, which aids in the cutting and stacking process. I'll note here that these dies are made out of inch and a half bar, which is less of a drawing action than say a half round die. However, I found that this is way easier to control and I was able to get some nice consistent thicknesses with these kiss blocks. So this is how they turned out and you saw there how the saddle can be added and removed. I ended up making two saddles for this next stacking cycle. One of them was a quarter of an inch and the other one was a half of an inch. What you just saw me doing there was spraying my stack with some WD-40. I picked that up from Fire Creek Forge as a means of reducing the oxygen in between the layers, thus having a nice clean forge weld. I think I'll use kerosene in the future, but this time around, I didn't have any kerosene on hand, so I went with the WD-40 and it worked out fairly well. I used my aggressive drawing dies to get the bulk of the material drawn out, and then I put my kiss blocks in there to make sure everything is a nice and consistent thickness. So what you see me doing here is using the kiss blocks for the first time. That's why I slowed it down. I just wanted to show you all that. And then I just drew out the rest of this billet, keeping the kiss blocks in there to make sure that in the flat direction or in the wider direction, I have the same thickness. I also put my flattening dies in here just to make sure the whole thing is straight. And I'm putting the billet in at a diagonal so I have a larger area of contact on my billet. This is how round two worked out. You can see I have a much straighter and flatter billet here with a consistent thickness, which is really nice. Now, technically this is supposed to be 45 layers, but since I ground so much off in the beginning, I'd say it's probably more like 35 layers. So I did the same thing. I cut it into three pieces and stacked it again, hit it with another forge welding process and uh, draw, drew it out to about a quarter of an inch. So that's gonna bring us up to around 105 to 135 layers. And I noticed that I was starting to run out of stock here because I had to remove so much in the first cycle. So I decided to start forging down the tang and turning this into a knife with the material that I had left. I didn't want to risk going through another stacking cycle to get up the layer count just because I didn't want to lose any more steel. After it cooled down, I cut off my rebar handle and decided to clean this guy up to make sure that I had a good chunk of steel here. So using my 60 grit belt on the belt grinder, 
I cleaned up the spine of this billet and then put it on my surface grinding attachment to clean up the flats. I got pretty aggressive with the feed here because I wasn't going for maximum flatness in this case. I just wanted to get all of the waves out from the forging process and make sure that I have a nice clean piece of steel. If you look really closely here, you can see the pattern, uh, which is obviously a low layer count, so it's a nice bold pattern here. Uh, I think it's gonna look pretty cool, so we'll see how it turns out. I then cut an angle on the front of the billet to aid me in forging my tip, and then I forge down the bevels. Uh, I don't go very far on the bevel forging just because I'm not very good at forging yet, and I wanna make sure to forge thick and grind thin. I clamp the blade in between two pieces of angle iron to cool down just so I can cool the blade in a straight orientation. And then I moved it over to the surface grinding attachment to clean up the flats again. So in this case, I'm just making sure that it's nice and flat so I can start my uh, main grinding process. I traced out the blade on a piece of paper and then kind of drew in what I envisioned this knife to look like with the material that I had. I then cut out my template and glued it on to my knife. This will allow me to easily grind the profile of this knife uh, to its final or close to final dimensions here. It's really interesting the differences in hidden tang and full tang knife design. I find it significantly more difficult to get the proportions right on a hidden tang blade. And I'm still getting better at it. The first couple iterations of my hidden tang knives were pretty uh, disproportionate. This one was a little bit better I think I'll get better in the future, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. Getting the width and the height of the Ricasso right, along with the width of the blade, and then also the handle and the guard, it's just, it can be a tough process for sure, and I'm still getting used to it. Speaking of that, I think y'all will see in the final product that I did not reduce the height here enough on the Ricasso, and my Ricasso was just a little too tall, so I will be more cognizant of that in the future. So I want to take this moment to thank Tyrell and Aaron Lee for setting up these challenges because it gave me a perfect excuse to buy a new tool, which is this stainless steel file guide with carbide faces from Bruce Bone. The machining on this file guide is amazing. It is way better than I could have done on my own file guide, which I did try to make a file guide and it worked just fine, but it wasn't even close to the level of precision of this one. So it's really nice to have a tool uh, of this caliper in your shop. While we are on the file guide topic, I'd like to make a few comments here on my original DIY file guide. I think it will work just fine for future makers if they want to make that design. However, the hardest part is getting the carbide flat and in line with each other. If you have a surface grinder with a hard grinding wheel on it that can grind carbide, I think it would be a good solution to make your file guide, put it on the surface grinder, and then make sure that the carbide is flat. I did not have access to something like that, so I found a slight variation between both pieces of the carbide that I got from the manufacturer. I will also note that the affixing of the carbide to the top of the DIY file guide without any type of recess was a fairly weak design, and if you're going to be using your file guide with the grinder, you run the potential of knocking off those carbide faces. So if you're going to make one on your own, make sure that you recess that carbide into your file guide. So you just saw me setting up my homemade heat treating oven on my welding table temporarily, just so I can roll it around the shop. And embarrassingly enough, this is the first time that I'm actually using this to heat treat a knife since building it in my old shop. So the first thing I'm doing here is doing some normalization cycles. Uh, I, w I didn't really know for sure if this steel is 1084 or uh, 1095 so I decided to treat it as 1095 instead and I worked down I think from around 1650 in normalizing cycles and I stepped down a few times one thing I did not do that I will do in the future is an annealing cycle after normalization at around 1400 degrees Fahrenheit before the quench so that's something I'll do in the future I'll do a few normalizing cycles in a kneeling cycle and then I'll bring it up to its appropriate quenching temperature and quench it. So anyway, that's, that's how this one worked out. I did a few normalizing cycles, I quenched it, and then I clamped it in between my quench plates just to hold the blade straight during the cooling process. It got plenty hard, at least hard enough to skate a file, 
and I decided to move on to the tempering process from here. I clamped the blade in between two pieces of angle iron and put it in my tempering oven at around 218 degrees Celsius for two two hour cycles. Speaking of heat treating, I've been toying around with the idea of getting some of those hardness testing files. I'm not really sure how precise they are. I know they have pretty large steps in between files, I think all the way up to five Rockwell points. So I think they'll give you an idea of what range of hardness you're in, uh, but it's not terribly accurate. So if I don't get the files, I think there is probably gonna be a hardness tester in my future. So any of you guys who have hardness testers, please give me some suggestions uh, in the comments on, on which one you would buy if you had to buy a new one today. Uh, I, I don't think I'll get it next month or anything, but I definitely think I will eventually own a hardness tester because not knowing the hardness of my heat treating process uh, is, a, is painful to me. <laughs> I, I feel like the unknown is, is just too much, especially when it comes to uh, trying to make some really high quality blades not knowing the hardness of those blades uh, even after the quench or after the tempering process is just not acceptable. So one of these days I'll definitely have a Rockwell hardness tester. The next step here will be grinding in our clip on the buoy. All I'm doing here is getting some good lighting on my contact wheel so I can kind of see what's going on. And I set up the rad arm table here from Northridge Grinders at a fairly aggressive angle on my contact wheel. I actually wish I would have taken the time to set this up at a steeper angle, especially because it gets reduced a little bit after grinding the major blade bevel. So my clip wasn't very large on this knife, and that is something I would change in the future. After getting my clip ground in, I marked out the center of my edge and used the work rest to grind to that edge center. I find that getting this initial aggressive bevel to the edge of your knife really helps with the grinding process and keeping the edge in the center of your blade. I then go to a 60 grit ceramic belt and start roughing in my main bevels. I'll be pretty much grinding a full flat grind on this blade. In an effort not to bore you guys with a bunch of grinding footage, I skipped around a lot here um, up the grits. I start off with the 60 grit, which you see here is a 60 grit finish. And then I move to a 120 grit J-Flex belt, uh, which is this one here. And then I move to a 320 grit belt to finish off my sanding on the machine. I then cleaned up the Ricasso area a little bit here and went on to making it my next tool for this build. And that tool is going to be a waterfall platen. I got this idea from Kyle Royer's videos. He uses waterfall platens on his buoys, so I decided to give it a shot. And if you guys remember, I actually made one of these a while back on my old grinder. So I wanted to make another one so that I can get into those plunge lines uh, nice and smoothly with a high grit J-Flex belt. And it actually helps in a couple ways. First of all, it allows you to really dial in the symmetry of your plunge lines. But second of all, it allows you to get all the scratches moving in the appropriate direction in a very tight spot there. All in all, it's a pretty simple attachment for your 2x72 belt grinder. I start off with a piece of two inch by quarter inch thick angle iron, which I cut a slot in, and then this will be how you actually attach it to the machine. And then I just took a piece of three inch plate here, uh, that's about three sixteenths of an inch thick, and machined the side so I can clamp it nice and square in my vise. And then I will be using this radiusing bit here, or I guess a radiusing end mill would be what you'd call it, to put a sixteenth of an inch radius on the edge of this platen. And this will be the point that actually digs in to where your plunge lines will be. So you can adjust this radius to have a different effect on your plunge line. So if you want a really big radius there uh, for very large knives, you can make that larger than a sixteenth of an inch. After we get those two pieces welded together, I attach it to the flat platen of my Northridge grinder here. And I gently tension the J-Flex belt and run it at a slow speed. One thing on these uh, waterfall platens is that the seam or the belt bump that you'll experience going over the face of the platen can be fairly severe. So you definitely want to be running these things fairly slow and you want to kind of stand off to the side just so that if something ever does happen and the knife tip is caught by the belt, it won't get flung right at you. 
When grinding this knife on this platen, I used a fairly obtuse angle in this case, coming off the radius face of the platen. However, I've seen people uh, kind of use a more acute angle there so that the belt under the platen is actually kind of going under it. And I think I'll try that in the future uh, just for a different effect in the plunge lines. I think it also allows you to use a file guide in that case to push up against the belt and you can get probably a little easier uh, symmetry there when using the file guide. However, I did find that getting a very symmetrical plunge line was pretty easy to do by eye with that waterfall platen. So I don't know exactly how necessary that is, but I'm gonna toy around with that angle in the future. Once I have the plunge line symmetrical and the blade ground to a 320 grit finish, I end up bringing up the whole blade to 600, a dirty 600 grit finish uh, before moving on to the next steps here. I decided to hit the Ricasso again in the shoulder area for my tang, and I don't really know the right time to true up the tang shoulders. I like doing it after heat treating actually because I don't like any type of oxidation uh, sitting on those shoulders and having to clean that up. So I think in the future I may just uh, grind in my shoulders there with the file guide after heat treating, but I'm still toying around with the right time to do that. Also, I've seen a lot of guys use the mill to machine in their shoulders. And I'm thinking if you're gonna machine in your shoulders, you should probably do it before heat treating, just because the hardened steel is obviously not gonna machine as well. Uh, but I think actually, I saw a video from Kyle Royer where he machined in the shoulders post heat treat by using a carbide end mill and draw tempering his tang so that the tang is not nearly as hard at the shoulder. So that's another method to try in the future as well. So there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat when it comes to getting nice square shoulders on your hidden tang knives. And I'm still trying to find the method that works the best for me. So what y'all see me working on here is the stainless steel guard for this buoy. I'm putting an eighth of an inch slot with an eighth of an inch end mill in it. And I actually bring it up a little bit larger than an eighth of an inch because that's the thickness of my Ricasso. I think it was around 130 thousandths I brought this slot up to. So having the mill for this operation is really nice. You can get a really good starting spot for your slot. And if you're really good with using the mill, which I am not, but if you are, uh, kind of like the Carl Andersons of the world, you can mill this almost precisely to the thickness of your Ricasso and basically be done with your guard fit up in a very short period of time. I am not quite to that level with this machine. Uh, I actually went just a hair too large on this slot and it's barely noticeable, but there is an ever so slightly small gap on my slot because I went just a hair too large trying to be cool like Carl Anderson. So in the future, uh, I think I may actually put a DRO on this mini mill just so that I can have a little bit more accuracy with my milling procedures for slots and spacers and things of that nature. Uh, for those of you who who don't have a mill, a DRO is a digital readout. So that's way more uh, easy to use or user friendly than the hand dials. I get a bunch of questions on this mini mill, where I got it and if I like it. I bought this one specifically from Harbor Freight, but there are a lot of companies that make the exact same mini mill and they just put different stickers on them. If I had to buy this mill again, I would probably buy the version of this mill from littlemachineshop.com. They actually have a version of this mill with a couple of upgrades already built into it. Upgrades like the uh, more robust gears. I think they have a more powerful motor on it and also a better tensioning system for the Z-axis travel. So uh, all those things I think come standard in their version of this mini mill. So that would be the one that I would buy. In an attempt to fix the over widening of that slot, what you saw me doing there was kind of peening over the sides of the guard slot. And that actually worked pretty well in getting rid of that little gap that I was mentioning earlier. So uh, that seems like an effective method. You wouldn't want to peen too hard because it did take a little bit of time to get the peen marks out of the face of the guard with the sandpaper. So uh, I think that's kind of a last ditch method there to tighten up your guard fit up. So with the construction of this handle, I'm going to be putting a finial on the back of the handle to pull it all together. And I'm going to use a captured thread method here, which I, I don't know if that's really what you call it, but that's what I'm gonna call it. 
and basically is kind of like a keyhole. I drill a hole and then a slot up to that hole and then I can put a fastener into that hole and it will hold the fastener in the longitudinal direction of this knife. So that's, that's kind of a cool thought there. I think I may have saw someone do this a while back. Uh, I probably did, that's where I got the idea, but I don't remember who. Uh, this actually worked pretty good. So if you're looking for a way to put threads onto the back of your knife without welding or without threading your tang, uh, this is definitely an option. Now, if you don't have a tight tang slot for the tang to go into, this uh, keyed method may not work because it could rotate inside of your handle. So this will only work if you have a very uh, close dimension slot for that to go into. Later on in the build process, I end up putting a dab of epoxy in that keyhole so that it holds it all together while I'm messing around with the knife. I didn't want to be fiddling with it and have the fastener falling out of the keyhole. So uh, you can also, I guess, use a welding method with that keyhole. So you can set up the keyhole, put the fastener in and weld it to the tang. I'm sure that would work just fine. Just make sure to heat up the whole weld afterwards and kind of normalize it so you don't have a weak spot there. So I'm gonna be drilling a hole in the handle and this is actually a spot where I messed up in the build. I didn't get this hole straight through this handle block. And I thought that I was with the setup that I have here, but I didn't take the time to flatten the sides of this handle block before drilling the hole through the center. And it actually caused me to have a hole that came out of the back of the handle block at a slight angle, which is not cool. And I didn't really notice until I was further along in the build. And I, I left it the way it was because this knife is more of a practice knife than anything. I'm gonna have some mistakes in it, but in the future, I will definitely flatten all four sides of the handle block before drilling my hole through the center of the handle block so that my layout is accurate. So what you see me doing here is using a drill guide spacer to drill some 16th of an inch holes into the back of my guard. And these are gonna be for hardened dowel pins that will eventually go in between the guard and the handle material. And what this does is it allows me to assemble and disassemble this handle in the same orientation multiple times during the building process so that I can work on each component individually. I really like doing this on these handles. It really makes working on the knife a little easier and it makes the glue up generally a little easier too so you're not trying to make sure everything's aligned during your glue up. You know it's aligned because you have alignment pins. Once I have the holes drilled, this is kind of the test fit up here and you can see that everything fits together nicely. Now, another thing I want to mention on the guard, and this is another large mistake with this build, was that the guard slot was actually too tall for the shoulder, meaning that there was a little bit of play in the up and down direction of this knife when looking at it from the side. And that's all fine and dandy at this point in the process, but it ended up coming back to bite me during the glue up. I wasn't paying attention, and I actually glued the guard onto the knife a little lower than I wanted to. So. I'll get into a little bit more detail in that towards the end of the video and it will be more apparent. At this point we were using a pencil here with a height gauge and a surface plate to mark out some layout lines on the handle so we can bend it down. To take off the bulk of the material I'll just use the bandsaw here and try to cut a little bit off of my scribe lines and then over to the belt sander in the horizontal orientation to grind the sides of the handle down to my scribe lines. I'm then gonna start working on the guard. And I had a little template that I made on the computer, printed out and laid out over my current guard slot. And that got me pretty close to what I was looking for with the dimensions of my guard. So that's kind of how it looks roughed in there. It has a flat top and a flat bottom. And I'm gonna be putting some bevels on the front and the back of this guard. To add those bevels, I'm using the height gauge there to mark out a scribe line and then I'm using the work rest at a fairly aggressive angle here to grind to that scribe line. So there's not really much uh, to say here other than I worked up the grits to a 320 grit finish on the belt and then I'm going to be moving over to the hand sanding bench to finish this guy out. To do that though it's really hard to clamp these small pieces for a knife. So I found this picture from Mr. Doyle and he has a sweet clamp that he made for his guards. 
So I'm going to recreate it with some scrap wood I had in the shop. He used my Carta and it had a couple other features, but I'm kind of doing the cheap and dirty version of his uh, vise here. So all I'm doing is kind of using the router bit and routing in some angles here, uh, drilling some holes through these two pieces, hammering in some of these uh, threads, I guess, for a quarter 20, and then using some cap head quarter 20 screws, or actually just some normal quarter 20 screws to hold it all together. So what this does, it allows you to clamp your hardware and move your hands around it without hitting the vise. So you can sand at an angle here and your hands aren't bumping into the vise the whole time. It's a pretty simple jig and I have a feeling I'll be using it a lot in the future whenever you know I'm working on a guard or a spacer that is hard to clamp in the vise. So this is definitely going into the drawer for future use. I get the guard up to a 320 grit finish and then I hit it with the Scotch-Brite belt just to make it uh, kind of satiny or a little bit more satiny than it already is. It gives it kind of a brush look. So I like that on the guard and it looked, it looked pretty good when I was all done with it. At this point, we're gonna do some handle shaping here or handle sculpting. One thing I didn't like about my previous two Hidden Tang knives is that I left the handle pretty bulky. I had pretty thick handles on those knives and I wanted to make this one substantially thinner. I think the thickness of this handle is around uh, three quarters of an inch at the thickest part, so it's definitely a little bit more of a sleek design. I tapered the sides of the handle from the rear to the front uh, ever so slightly, maybe an eighth of an inch total over the length of the handle, and then I used the two inch contact wheel uh, to kind of hollow out the back of it and give it that nice sweep, coke bottle sweep on the back of the handle. I then sanded the handle up to a thousand grit finish and hit it with the buffing wheel with some green compound to give it a nice sheen. So this is the fourth and final tool that I will be making for this build. This is going to be a guard jack. And what this does is it will press the guard into the shoulders so that you can either, I guess, solder it or epoxy it in place. Uh, or if you're going to do a press fit, this will actually press the guard up onto your Ricasso. Uh, they sell these. I've seen these in a couple different places, but it seemed like a pretty simple thing to make. I didn't go through all the details here, but I may actually make a short dedicated video on how to make uh, this guard jack, but uh, with plans and all. But it's pretty simple. As you can see, it's just uh, six holes there and a slot in the middle uh, with some quarter 20 fasteners. So I etched my maker's mark on this blade on the Ricasso, and I actually think uh, in my opinion, I did it upside down. I'm sure you can do it both ways, but I think I like the idea of the maker's mark being readable when holding the knife in your hand instead of being readable when looking at it uh, from the tip in. So I think I'm going to flip my maker's mark on hidden tang knives in the future. To etch the Damascus, I have a solution of 50-50 ferric chloride and water. Uh, it's about two years old at this point, so it's a little weaker, so it takes a little longer to etch. I'm doing four to five minute etching cycles, and I did four of them uh, for this blade. In between etching cycles, I hit it with 2500 grit sandpaper, uh, just so I can get all of the 15 and 20 pieces on this blade nice and shiny. So this is what it looked like after my final etching cycle. Overall, for only being around 130 or so layers, I really like the pattern. I think it came out pretty good, a nice random pattern here. You know, in the future, I'll do some more exotic Damascus, but I was just happy to have this first piece uh, come out solid and usable, to be honest. So that's how it turned out. After I get it all uh, etched, I want to neutralize the acid. To do so, I just kind of put baking soda all over the blade and rub it in for a couple minutes to make sure all that acid is neutralized. So here I put a little bit of epoxy uh, on the back end of the guard, and then I put my guard jack onto the tang and pressed that guard into the shoulder. This is the point that I mentioned earlier that I messed up. I didn't line up that guard in the up and down direction appropriately, and I actually glued the guard a little too low on the Ricasso. And what this did is it brought the entire handle down because that handle has alignment pins in it. So that issue cascaded throughout the entire handle all the way up to the rear being at the wrong angle. It actually made my handle no longer line up with the Ricasso which, which really made the knife not flow as well as it should have. I just want to point out that I'm mentioning all these mistakes on this knife, uh, not necessarily to be hard on it or anything, but I just want to point out to all of y'all 
uh, some of the spots that can go wrong or some of the operations that can go wrong when making a knife like this. And just so maybe you don't make that mistake on your own builds. Uh, I thought about it and I could have made this whole video uh, not show those flaws a little easier. You could do some selective editing and picture taking and stuff and not really see some of the flaws in this knife. But I decided against that and I would rather show all the flaws in this knife so that y'all don't make the same mistakes. So towards the end here, not only will I show the flaws, I'll show them in excruciating detail <laughs> so you can see uh, all the mistakes there. But the first picture I'm gonna show y'all is what the knife looks like from a flattering angle. And this would probably be the only picture that I would show if I wasn't gonna show you all the mistakes. You can see here that uh, you can't really tell that there's misalignment between the handle and the ricasso and the finial on the back, you can't see that, so you don't know it's not centered and things of that nature. But here are some of the gruesome details on this knife so you can see all of its flaws. So the first major flaw that we will point out is the most obvious, which is the finial not being centered in the back of the handle. This was caused by not squaring up my block before drilling my holes, so my layout was actually misaligned. I drilled my holes where I wanted to drill them, however my layout being based off of a non-square block did not provide me with a straight hole through the block. So make sure you square up your handle blocks before trying to drill through them. The other major issue with this knife was that the guard was epoxied to the shoulder lower than I originally intended. When putting the handle with alignment pins into the guard, it actually brought the entire assembly down which not only caused the guard and handle fit up to be a little sloppier, it also brought the top of the handle lower than the top of the spine of the knife at the Bricasso, and that kind of ruined the lines of this knife. I wanted those two to be in line with each other. I wanted the spine of the knife and the top of the handle to line up with each other. So by messing up the guard, it actually messed up the handle. So that kind of was, like I said earlier, a cascading effect. Now, with all that being said, there are some components of this knife that I really like. First and foremost, I really like how the Damascus finish came out. Uh, the Damascus pattern was cool, it was random. It was kind of neat to make Damascus for the first time with the new press. So I really like how the blade itself turned out. I feel like my plunge lines and my grinds were really good on this knife by utilizing that waterfall platen. I also like the thinner handle on this knife versus some of the other hidden tang knives I've made in the past that have thick and bulky handles. This one feels very slim and slender in the hand, and it kind of makes the knife feel a little more, I guess, fast, for lack of a better word. So yeah, those are the things that I really like about this knife. And you know, I plan on getting better with these hidden tang knives. And speaking of that, if there are any tips that you guys have that you think could improve my hidden tang game, go ahead and put them in the comment section below. Also, while you're down there, consider liking and subscribing to the channel. It would really help us out. With that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.